Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. With your host, Dr. Drum McNaughton, CEO of The Change Leader, a consultancy that helps higher ed leaders holistically transform their institutions. Learn more at thechangeleader.com. Changing Higher Ed is sponsored by Blackbaud, the world's leading cloud software company powering social good. With their cloud solution for higher education, Blackbaud connects thousands of campuses worldwide. Visit blackbaud.com slash higher ed to learn how they can help your institution deliver a better experience. And now, here's your host, Drum McNaughton. Thank you, David. We welcome back one of our favorite guests, Tom Netting who's here to give us an update on what's going on in Washington and at the Department of Education. Tom has worked in the public policy arena for over 28 years, advocating before Congress, federal agencies, and state governments on behalf of private institutions of higher education and post-secondary education companies. He's a leader in strategic policy development and advocacy in the areas of higher education, workforce development, health care, veteran affairs policy, and the procurement of federal appropriations. Tom, welcome back to the show. Great to have you on again. Drum, it's a pleasure to be with you yet again. Oh, we always have such a good time, don't we? Uh, amen. I, I, I always enjoy talking with you and always enjoy sharing what I can in terms of the latest information and learn something new every time we talk. As do I. And speaking of the latest information, what is going on in D.C.? Well, (laughs) that's a pretty loaded question. A lot, to say the least. (laughs) Um, We certainly have a lot going on here in Washington yet again. I think the thing that has been omnipresent in my world these days is the regulatory environment and a great deal of focus on what the Department of Education has done and some effective dates that all came to pass just this past week on July 1st. There were, as you'll recall from some of our other conversations, there's been a series of changes and revisions to the regulations that the Trump administration has worked on through the process of negotiated rulemaking, revising a number of the Obama era regulations, including issues like the gainful employment rule, the borrower defense to repayment regulations for students, seeking relief and remuneration from uh, institutions that have had issues with false advertising or misconduct in relation to the delivery of the educational content. More recently, the negotiations that resulted in consensus around accreditation, state authorization, and some additional changes in the areas of teacher teach grants and faith-based education. A number of these rules because of what they call the master calendar requirement and legislative and statutory requirements that for a regulation under Title IV to take effect on July 1st of an award year, it has to be published in final form the preceding November 1st. So a number of the regulations that we've been working on have just now, even though they've been deliberated since 2018 and throughout 2019, sent through the the notice of proposed rulemaking and then the final rule process have only just now officially gone into effect. Uh, There are a number of things in those regulations that are very important, including not the least of which are a number of changes to the accreditation process, a blurring if not a removal of the basic understanding of regional versus national, uh, national accreditation, some significant changes with regard to state authorization and how distance education is being delivered, which certainly is at the forefront of everybody's minds right now because of the pandemic and all of higher education's transition to a form of hybrid or temporary distance education. So that's what's been keeping me busy in terms of tracking the interpretations of Congress in terms of the CARES Act and some of the remedies in the short term, including not only financial, but policy guidance but then the underlying work of the actual regulations put forth by the department. So let's start with the the stuff that's gone into effect on July 1st. Maybe start with the state authorization and the distance ed, because with the COVID, that has changed everything. And the department actually came out and extended their, their guidance for distance online education from the summer all the way to the end of fall term. 
loosening up a lot of regulations. That's correct. And several of those deal with uh, longstanding issues that have been discussion points even prior to the pandemic, but certainly, again, were elevated as a result. The department had been looking at things that are important in the delivery of and the assurance of quality of education under online education. And one of the key terms that they spent a lot of time focusing on was whether or not there was regular and substantive interaction between the deliverer, the institution, and the academician, whether that be the professor or their, uh, their teacher's assistants or whomever, but the making sure that the delivery of the education was in a manner that would, A, ensure that it was quality going out and quality received. And that in, entails making sure that both sides of the equation are, are doing their just part. So there were concerns that that was not necessarily being fully tracked or fully engaged by the institutional sides by the department. So they, as part of the negotiations, look to put more of a definition around what, quote, regular and substantive interaction looked like. Um, I think that that will provide certainly greater guidance for the institutions. Many institutions, including well-named and renowned entities like Western Governors University, who was cited and fined for the very concern of being more, quote, correspondence than online because of their concerns of this regular and substantive interaction issue, um, wanted this guidance. So Southern New Hampshire University, go up and down the list, University of Phoenix and others. Uh, many of these institutions were felt that they were doing regular and substantive interaction, but just not necessarily in the framework or under the guidance that the department had hoped for. The good news, and it shows that once again, negotiations can bear positive fruit, was through these negotiations, new definitions have been put forward that still allow for all of those different online deliverers to continue to provide the type of education that they are, but do it in a manner that is more comfortable and more uh, trackable or traceable through the department. Uh, so that was one major change. Another major change with regard to distance education and online was a, a look at changes to the ways in which institutions are to account for their student populations. Again, with online education, you have a significant blurring of where you're going to recruit your students. We no longer have the notion of essentially the domicile of recruiting individuals at bricks and mortar bringing in people in from their, region, from their region. You can have individuals in Maine recruiting students, having students from, uh, from San Diego. So literally opposite ends, truly polar opposite ends of the country. So a number of changes have also been made to the regulations that recognize that online education and distance education allows for the recruitment of students across all boundaries and have modified those regulations through reciprocity agreements and through NC NCSERA, the reciprocity organization that includes basically all states except for the District of Columbia and California to be inclusive of a set of regulatory changes to where if you're compliant with NC NCSERA, you're basically compliant with all of the state's regulations. And that becomes important because we want to make sure through integrity of the triad that all of those students are protected, regardless of whether what state they're in and where they're coming from, that they're protected uh, by a, a basic set of underpinning standards for the delivery of online education. Well, NC NCSERA was in, in effect, it's been in effect for a while now with those 49 states. Uh, with the NEGREG 2019, there were some changes as far as holding institutions accountable, were there not? Uh, there were, but but again, they were and done in, the, in, the, in a way in which instead of having to try and some would say have us to the bottom. Others would say have the challenge of trying to respond to 49 or 50 different states' individual regulations. The good news drum was that while they expect institutions to be able to show that they're providing good quality protections for their students, the NC NCSERA standards kind of gave one set of standards to where you didn't have to try and individually on a student-by-student -student basis or a state-by-state -state basis try and meet the individual uh, state authorization requirements of the state if you met the NC NCSERA requirements. So they worked in the collaboration and the development of these sets of regulations to ensure that there was integrity so that the states didn't lose, and so it wasn't a race to the bottom, but that also that each state, each institution didn't have to try and deal with trying to 
uh, meld or combine all of the requirements of each individual state into their regulation. They also, as part of that, looked at the uh, their location of residence versus their location of, of submission of their files in terms of Title IV, so that again, you accommodate more of the individuals and provide more protection to the students. Yeah, that's, that's very important. You know, a couple of other things with that, national versus regional accreditors, that distinction is getting blurred if not going away. It is, uh, again, you bring up a very good point and it comes back to some of the same prior discussion. Given the fact that students are being recruited and students are choosing to attend institutions that are no longer geographically uh, related to a specific area, when we had SACS, the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools as a regional accreditor, or Northwest or WASC up in the Northwest, or any of the others, it was basically those were founded on the premise of a lot of what was the regionally based institutions and their mission. Well, obviously now with online education and the ability for individuals to choose where they'd like to go to school, those regional bases and constructs have kind of floated away in and of themselves. And the desire, once again, to protect all students, regardless of where they live versus where they want to go to school, has again brought about this notion of a blurring of regional versus national in terms of the notion of accreditation, what has been maintained, and, and candidly, what has been strengthened, in my opinion, in the regulations that have just been put forward is while those lines are blurred, the elasticity and the ability for basically all accreditors to be more flexible and more, more reliant on working with the institutions that they recognize to achieve a greater assessment of the quality of those institutions based on their own mission is now part of what we have coming out on the back end. So whereas regional might have been more two-year, four-year, and maybe based on the region, different, different forms of disciplines versus national being more uh, akin to or focused on career and technical and vocational, we've seen certainly those lines of education between the various portions of the, of the schools done away with or blurred. And now we're seeing the same thing with the accreditors. I think it's just candidly a lot of a sign of the times and a sign of uh, the advances that we're making in technology and in innovation that accreditation is catching up with. We still have programmatic accreditation, and I think we're still going to need that. And it's a nice blend where once again, while institutions and the overarching review of them may be something that regional and national disappears for certain programs where they delve deeper into the nuances and the delivery and the core curriculum, those assessments at that certificate certification or licensure level I think are still going to be needed and still melded with the overarching accreditation process. And that's all been maintained. Yeah, I think you're right with that. Uh, you know, one institution I was looking up on their website for a, a master's program for a, for a friend, and their requirements was a, were a 3.0 from a regionally accredited school. And I think you're going to start seeing those kind of distinctions going away which personally I think is a good thing. Well, I think you're going to see that in, in, in a broader sense as well. I talked about the disclosure requirements that are new, that have been brought about as effective July 1st as part of these new regulations. Another portion of that is a requirement that all institutions of higher education are going to have to now expressly state publicly what their transfer of credit policies are. Doesn't mean that the institutions aren't still capable of setting their own standards and their own parameters and guidelines. But to your point, once those are becoming more consumer friendly or consumer uh, clear, it's going to shed some light on whether or not there have been limitations in the past that have been prohibitive to the students and maybe not in the always in the best interest of the student. Certainly we want to respect the integrity of the incoming institution to assess the education of the individual coming in with them, but with the advent of a direct assessment, prior learning experience, and so many other new and innovative modalities that are being utilized, I think that you're gonna see some changes in, in the way in which institutions look to assess the, the, 
the portability of, of education prior to entrance into their institution. And you're going to see more of, I think, a, a hybrid or a cross-section of individuals seeking and finding multiple ways to attain a degree. I think you're right. Uh, you know, it kind of kind of reminds me of, oh gosh, one institution I was I was working with a while ago who had these requirements in, and they were losing out on some really good students. And so, hopefully, this will change. Anything else, or should we move on to cares? Um, I think one or two other things just to remind people of as we look at some of these new final July 1st disclosures is that the institutions are going to have to put all of this information up on their websites. And interestingly enough, the regulations are very specific about it must be conspicuously provided in 12 point font (laughs) on both the websites. Yeah, you laugh, but it's, I mean, it's true. That's how far they've gone. Uh, it shows you the degree to which they want to make sure that this information gets out there. And it not only includes new potential information on things like transfer of credit, but also on a number of other issues, placement rates, retention rates, other information regarding student services. And in all due respect, some of that is very new for traditional academia to start to be sharing with their consumer, their potential enrollees or their families or just the general public. It's going to be interesting to see how some of that plays out. Again, that rolls back into accreditation. Accreditors at the regional level didn't normally ask for those type of outcomes assessments. They're changing some of their thought process as a result of these regulations and also, candidly, a result of the consumer wanting to be more aware of what the cost-benefit analysis is for higher education, given rise in cost time to time and energy and the differences in the credentials and the like, all of this is playing into a more conform, uh, more, more informed consumer, but also uh, a more deliberative process of sharing some of that information with the consumer and with potentially you know, the, the employers on the back end as well. Well, it makes perfect sense. I remember having a conversation last year with Diane Hour Jones there at the department, and she was saying they were going to do away with gainful employment and bring in the college scorecard 2.0. And I know that's fairly well along at this point. I don't think they've released the, the new version of it, but when they do, it's going to do exactly what you say. They've done a great deal of that. And, and again, this is all to the department. Um, it focuses on, once again, they're revamping a lot within the department. Next gen, next generation of the iteration of financial aid. One of the portions of what you were alluding to that they have already put into place is the front facing or the student side. They have totally re- re- revised studentaid.gov, which is, again, the student consumer facing side uh, and done a number of things to provide more information to the consumer prior to their making their decision, walking them through more of how to make their decisions. They also have provided new avenues to combine with the loan servicers and and the like to give the students more financial and fiscal responsibility and um, financial literacy education so they understand more about their loans versus a grant, what's expected of them, what interest starts to accrue and what that looks like over the life of the loan and their repayment obligations on the back end, all of which have been, I think, well received by the entire higher education community. While we're talking about all these regs that are going into effect with the institution, the department is continuing to work on next gen. They're currently in the process of looking at how to move beyond the the forward facing platform to the students and prospective students and their families to the actual platforms that deliver and administer federal student financial aid and the back end servicing and collection. So there's a lot going on, like I said, and like we talked about from the outset, within the department and within higher education policy. We, we touched the surface on several of these issues, but you know, again, there's even more than that, and there's even more because of the pandemic around CARES Act and some of the immediate issues that we've been confronted that has not put aside all of these other discussions, but made it so that we're truly having to walk and chew gum at the same time. Which, for a lot of us, that's very difficult. I can't rub my head and pat my stomach at the same time. I've never been able to do it. (laughs) So CARES Act, where are we? What's going to come next? Uh, Well, CARES Act that has already happened, uh, the CARES Act that has been put forward 
provided, as I think you're well aware from some of our prior discussions and certainly from what you've shared in your podcast and what people have seen in the media, the federal government as part of their third uh, economic stimulus package provided a considerable substantial amount of money, specifically through education stabilization funds to elementary and secondary and higher education. A great deal of those higher education funds, some $14 billion, was spread across the entire higher education community with some pretty significant stipulations. Uh, the first one was that all of these funds were to be used based on the disruption as a result of the national emergency, the COVID pandemic, and were to be delivered and distributed based on the disruptions related to COVID in two specific types of accounts. One that would go directly to students because of this disruption that it caused the individuals as students from their life and their ability to attend education, and another portion or a facet of the funds that was to go to the institution for them to be able to utilize those funds to make the changes necessary to sustain delivery of education during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Both sets of those funds have already been delivered to the, for the most part from the federal government to the institutions to then deliver to their students. As a result of these new funds, institutions were obligated from the student side to determine a plan and a method of delivery to ensure that the funds were being distributed to those most disrupted and most in need. And therefore, Congress put as portions of the guidance associated with these funds that 75% of the allotment received by the institution uh, of the first half of two portions of the funds must go to individuals that were need-based, so federal Pell Grant mm -hmm. recipients and the like and the other 25% to non-need-based, non-federal aid students. But within that, there was greater determinations that needed to be made. A great deal of discussion has been and arguments have been made over eligibility for DACA students and other students uh, that were prohibited uh, under the guidance, and those conversations are still ongoing. On the institutional side, the funds were to be used and are continuing to be used for the transition, so to move to temporary distance education. If you think about it, a lot of institutions, you have your bricks and mortar class, and you may have an online class that's separate and distinct from that, but now everything became online. So how do you transition over the last semester, meaning the, the, the spring semester of last year, to be able to provide basically for every student in every institution that moved forward after spring break was providing their education online. That included trying to convert the curriculum trying to bring candidly a number of instructors up to speed on how to educate online because there are differentiations in the delivery, you're smiling, uh, in the delivery that's provided online uh, and, the, and the ways in which the assessments, yet again, are, are delivered and modified to make sure the integrity of the, not only the delivery, but the assessment on the back end. Uh, and a lot of schools had to come up with uh, considerable outlays of cash in order to be able to make those transitions. And you also have the concerns and the reality of without the students on campus for the second half of the spring term, there were a lot of normal and customary costs that were still sunk costs by every institution and you know, not necessarily being taken advantage of or fully reimbursed. You had all the students that were seeking uh, queries as to whether or not their housing and their tuition program and their, their uh, meal plan programs and others were going to be reimbursed because they were no longer on the college campus. But we're paying for those. Uh, all of that became part of what Congress gave the ability for the institutions to utilize portions of their CARES Act funding for. Interestingly enough, Congress also said that of this half of the money delegated to your institution that could be used for institutional charges, if you didn't use all of it for your institution, that the rest of it could go to students. And I'm finding that there are a lot of institutions that candidly are looking to and that are providing more, even more than just half of the overall funding, more than the 50% threshold to their students. Uh, other institutions, because of the way in which the proposal was put forward, that were not receiving as much of an allotment of fund as, the, as they truly needed in order to be able to provide for their institution and more and or more or as importantly to their students. I'm talking about a number of state colleges and universities, community colleges and others, that would have much preferred the assessment to be on total enrollment and total population as opposed to the defining lines based on need-based uh, and looking at need-based student populations first and foremost. 
So that kind of gives you the, the back end on the CARES Act. And there were some policy provisions in there. Uh, the ones that everybody heard of was all of the relief that was provided to students in terms of no loan repayments, no seeking of individuals through uh, alternative requirements to have them pay back their student loans. So none of the negative consequences were regarding student loan eligibility and repayment, because all of those have been laid aside, not only through the pandemic, but now, now at least through the end of the year. We transitioned to where we sit today, Drum, and although there had been ongoing discussions throughout June on a possible fourth or fifth, depending on who's counting, next round of stimulus funding, um, there were major discussions and major deliberations on differences of opinion between Dems and Republicans on what the direction and what the focus of any new funding should be. Uh, a great deal of the Republicans' viewpoint and vantage point is that it needs to go towards health care, towards education, towards job retraining and advancement, but that a lot of that should still focus on trying to find ways to safely allow individuals to transition back into educa that education or the job or employment with safety nets involved. So things like uh, test testing in terms of testing prior to returning to work or ways in which to test until we have a vaccine and then obviously fair and, and um, uh, rapid disbursement of the vaccines into the future. Senator Alexander and Senator Murray had two hearings on higher education and general safety of returning to work and higher ed. Uh, and then had one as well, a separate one as well on elementary and secondary. All of this to say that uh, the Republicans' viewpoint is that first and foremost, there should be liability protections uh, and that those protections should extend to the employers as well as to institutions. The Democrats are looking at a great deal of additional money for those state colleges and universities and community colleges and others and a, re and a reversal or a reversion back to total population served as opposed to necessarily just need-based uh, population serve in providing additional fiscal resources in this next round of funding. We'll see how those deliberations play out. Uh, and again, the liability issue is a major, major sticking point between the Democrats and the Republicans in the House and Senate. The House Democrats have voted on a major stimulus package called the HEROES Act. Uh, there is considerable sum, again, 14 to $15 billion uh, and directed funds to higher education, and another $10 billion or so that the states, uh, through their governors, would be able to provide to higher education, and a considerable amount to elementary and secondary as well. Uh, that is in the House bill. Senator Murray, just before uh, the, the July 4th recess, also introduced another proposal, which is kind of the Senate Democrats' proposal. It's the CCCERA, which is the Childhood uh, the Coronavirus Child Care uh, Corrections and Educational Relief Act, CCERA. Uh, a number Where do of they the, come up with these things? We live in a world of acronyms, Drum. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, the, of, of importance there is that, again, there is a considerable amount of financing provided uh, for all sectors of the higher education community in Ms. Murray's bill that is supported by 36 some odd Democrats. Uh, one of the key distinctions between the House Democrats and the Senate Democrats bill is the House Democrats bill does not include any private proprietary institutions as being eligible or, more importantly, their students uh, of being eligible for any additional funds based on the disruption of the pandemic. Ms. Murray and the Democrats in the Senate have limited percentage-wise the portion of funds that can go to the for-profit community but have at least included us and included us given the overall 134 to 135 billion that they're proposing. Uh, they're proposing 1.5% of that can be used within the proprietary sector for their students. They're also proposing, again, to collect back the students that were missed in the prior CARES Act, those individuals that were totally online, regardless of institution, another 1% designated to them. So even though those might sound like small percentages, when you look at one and a half percent of $135 billion, that's basically almost $2 billion in funds that would potentially go to that student population, 1.3 billion that would go to the online students, and then traditional academia, as we think of it, community colleges, two-year and four-year colleges, and universities at the state level, 
uh, would have those other portions of funds to distribute and disperse as well. Yeah, when well, we're talking a billion here, billionaire, sometimes pretty soon we're talking about some real money. Well, <laughs> when, when, when there's already $3 trillion out there, you can make a very strong case for uh, the fact that where are our deficit and our fiscal hawks uh, up on Capitol Hill? Because you know, sooner or later, even though this money is offline of the federal budget right now, it's not under PAYGO, it's not under portions of the federal budget, it still is a hit to our overall uh, indebtedness and our overall responsibility. And you're, you're hearing more and more of that conversation up on Capitol Hill. Sooner or later, those same students and those same individuals, and I'm sorry I'm on a little bit of a rant here, but those same individuals we're trying to protect and trying to make sure are capable of sustaining their livelihoods and their future throughout the pandemic, at some point are gonna to have to also look to pay for all the monies that are being provided right now to try and get us through that pandemic. Absolutely. And so we're getting close to the end of our time, Tom, and as much as we enjoy talking with you, uh, we do need to move on. So what's a crystal ball and uh, what's next? Um, good question. I think the two to three things top of mind for what's next. There are, is another set of regulations scheduled to take effect on August 14th. It is a huge set of very contentious regulations. It's with regard to Title IX, our campus crime and safe, safety and security. The Trump administration did another round of negotiation on these rules, uh, made significant changes to those that were put forth under the Obama administration. Uh, those that are in support of these regulations believe that it provides a fairer or more equitable balance between the victims and those accused. So those regulations are scheduled to take effect in August. And so we'll be looking at additional guidance from the department on how those regulations are yet to come forward. We'll additionally be looking for more guidance from the department on the CARES Act, even though the funds are being delivered and expended. As I said before, there are continued questions of exactly how far institutions can go and what they utilize those funds for. Um, there's a big question over lost revenue. There is specific guidance in the rules that allow Title III, Title V, and Title VII institutions. Short way of saying many of the institutions that serve the lowest socioeconomic classes and underprivileged groups, uh, specifically Hispanic serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities, our tribal, and, our tribal institutions and the like, are given special deference that lost revenue could be included as portions of the funds they receive a separate set of money but whether or not that initial group of cares act funding can be utilized for revenue as well as payroll and other things that the department has given clear guidance um, and last but certainly not least uh, we'll be looking at the next round of the cares act funding it is very likely that whatever congress works on they will attempt to finish in the two to three weeks leading up to the august recess so Literally three weeks from now, uh, we'll know a lot more about what the final outcome of liability issues are and how much financing will be coming to students and institutions and other parameters uh, around that legislation. It will also include, and one of the last things I'll share with you that I'm fighting for, is while they did a lot of good things with the CARES Act to protect students, uh, as is often the case when you try and move major pieces of legislation so quickly, there are a couple of things that need to be cleaned up like students that were put on leaves of absence because they're in professions and disciplines that require them to be off-site in externships or in clinic settings at a, at a hospital or you know, a hospital or a care facility and the like. They simply aren't able to do right now under COVID. Uh, there's a 180-day maximum on a leave of absence. Well, certainly with how long COVID seems to be going on, we're likely to run through that 180-day period and we need to do some things to yeah. protect students on that institutions on some things related to financial responsibility. NC Stara has requirements that you have to be administratively and financially capable, and that results in a composite score ratio on getting in the weeds with the Department of Ed regs. But if you don't meet it, then you're not eligible to participate in Sarah, which means you can't provide online education and be eligible for Title IV. Well, all institutions are gonna have a hard time meeting those composite ratios given the circumstances that we're all in with regard to the lost revenue and the loss uh, of a number of different things financially uh, with all institutions. So those are things that I'm working with Congress and I hope Congress addresses in the next iteration of the stimulus package. 
Well, yeah, there's so many things going on. I think that uh, we probably ought to gather, get together sometime in the middle of next month and uh, sort it all out again. What do you think? I would be happy to do that, like I said at the, from the outset. Enjoy, and I always enjoyed the time with you, Drum. Likewise, Tom. Thanks again for being on the uh, show, and uh, best of luck to you guys back there in D.C. Likewise. Thank you, Drum. Thank you. Thanks for listening this week. And a special thank you to this week's special guest, Tom Netting, for his Washington update on the Department of Education and the other things that are going on back in D.C. Tom, always great to talk with you and have you back on the show. I also want to give a special shout out to our sponsor, BlackBaud. Visit blackbaud.com slash higher ed to learn about their cloud fundraising, accounting, education management, scholarship, and analytics solutions that are powering some of higher ed's top institutions. Our next guest is Dr. Mary Wardell Giraduzzi, a repeat guest. Mary is the Associate Provost and Chief Diversity Officer for the University of San Francisco, and she'll be talking with us about the Black Lives Matter movement and the importance of diversity and inclusion in today's higher education environment. This episode of Changing Higher Ed was brought to you by BlackBaud, the world's leading cloud software company powering social good. Be sure to visit blackbaud.com slash higher ed to learn how they can help your institution deliver a better experience from admissions to advancement. Changing Higher Ed is a production of The Change Leader, a consultancy committed to transforming higher ed institutions. Find more information about this topic along with show notes on this episode at changinghighered.com. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to the show. We would also value your honest rating and review. Email any questions, comments, or recommendations for topics or guests to podcast at changinghighered.com. Changing Higher Ed is produced and hosted by Dr. Drum McNaughton, post-production by David L. White.